a long minute. There we go. <laughs> Calling to order this uh, regular board meeting, the Mercer Island uh, School Board, on April 5th. And I'd like to get a motion to establish agenda, please. I move we establish the agenda. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, we have our agenda. Our next item is <coughs> a board recognition. Uh, and Donna, go ahead and take that. So good evening. First up, we, we actually have two recognitions tonight, but we're going to start with the um, big check presentation. <laughs> we have um, representing the um, PSE Energy Efficiency Grant that the um, district has received. It was awarded to the district for enhanced energy efficiency systems installed at our recent schools and remodel projects, so Northwood Elementary and Islander Middle School. And as the board already may be aware, PSE Energy Management Engineers worked closely with the school district project managers at the design and construction phases to optimize the environmental conservation opportunities available. All told, the PSE Energy Incentives from the Northwood Project and the IMS construction projects added up to a $123,000 grant from PSE to the Mercer Island School District to support the more energy efficient installations made at those schools. So at this time, if our representatives, I know Wendy is here, and if they would like to come up and introduce themselves, and then we'll have the board come around for the big presentation of the check. Well, thank you. I'm Andy Wappler, Vice President of Customer Operations and Communications with PSC and a, and a 1982 graduate of Mercer Island High School. And pleased to be here tonight. <laughs> thank you. I also attended uh, Lake Ridge uh, and uh, let's see, Lake Ridge, Island Park, uh, Mercer Crest, if you lived here at the time, and South Mercer Junior High when there were two. Um, that sounds like I got kicked out a lot. My parents just happened to move a few times. Uh, and I still remember all those great teachers going all the way back to my kindergarten teacher, Miss Page, to teachers in high school, and appreciate what the schools certainly did for me, what they continue to do in the community. And we're honored here tonight. We have our big check. We have Tom Anderson and Jeff Peterson who led the projects, uh, one for Northwood and one for Islander Middle School. And they'll have more efficient lighting and heating and ventilation. And we estimate the savings for the school at about $18,000 a year, which is fantastic. Maybe you can do something like extend the school day or the school year. <laughs> you know? Okay, well, maybe not. Maybe just something else, tech in the classroom, I don't know. But that's what I love about these projects is they help the schools really live what they're teaching the kids about sustainability and the environment and also help the schools have more resources for your job. It's also wonderful to me because most of the time we bring people a bill. So it's nice to bring you a check. We're excited to be able to help the schools. We appreciate what you do in the community. So thank you very much for having us here tonight. So if, we, if the board could come forward to um, in front of the dais and we will um, make sure that we get all of the appropriate photography done. So that was energy, now we have imagination. Now we have imagination. So we also have here tonight um, 
some of our students, I know not all of them have been able to attend, and I know we um, have s hopefully some staff members here representing our Mercer Island teams that um, will be advancing to the Destination Imagination Global Finals. Um, we have a lot of the students here, and I'm going to have them come up and introduce themselves to the board and tell us which project they were on. But I would like to... Um, announced that out of a record of 12 qualifying district teams at the Destination Imagination State Tournament last month, three of our teams have qualified for the global finals to be held next month in Knoxville, Tennessee. Destination Imagination is an educational program under the guidance of teacher Mark Headley, who was not able to be here. <laughs> oh, he is here. I, could, I took my glasses off to read. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, in which student teams solve a variety of open-ended challenges and present their solutions at tournaments. Participants have represented all four elementary schools, the middle school and the high school, and some of them are here tonight for recognition of their achievements. So s our Destination Imagination students if you want to make your way up to the podium over here to my right and kind of line up and introduce yourselves and tell us which project, which team you are here representing. All kids that oh, yeah. participated in Destination Imagination, come on up. You have your whole team here. Uh, not my whole team here, but please <laughs> your eyes. All right, hi, I'm Oliver Schaff, and I'm a high schooler at MIHS, and I'm representing the scientific team, SAUCE, advancing the global finals this year. Hi, my name is Bridger Burke. Hi, my name is Jasper Gear. Uh, we're representing the uh, improv team that got third place at state. Hi, I'm Kyle. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, we are representing DIY. Uh, we didn't make it to Global, but we uh, won a Da, da Vinci Award. And I am Jonathan. Good job. Good job. Hi, I'm Sid, and uh, our team uh, got uh, is going to Global Finals, and we got a Da Vinci. Um, so yeah, we worked really hard. So yeah. <laughs> I'm Tyler, and um, I'm representing Between Dimensions. <laughs> I'm Daniel. But just I'm Elliot. I'm also part of that team. <laughs> I'm Deb. I'm Keegan. <laughs> I'm Sahana. <laughs> I'm in elementary school, and I'm representing the technical team who got third place in state. Say your oh. name. Oh. oh, we are we haven't decided yet. <laughs> Say your name, guys. Oh. <laughs> Adelaide Sweats. <laughs> I'm Ava Eberhart, and I'm Sophia. <laughs> um. I'm Sam Pador. Um, we're from the team. <laughs> no, you name. say your name. I'm Ryan. We're from the team Brave Cowards, and we were in the Fine Arts Challenge. My name is Calvin Cavalock. We got second place in the state tournament. My name is Alex Millman, and I want to give a big thanks to Mr. David Baxter. Hello, I, my name is Madison, and I'm representing the team, uh, the Taco Cats. We got second place at state. <laughs> Didn't go to Globals, though. So I just wanted to say that we're very proud of all of our students this year for the great work that they put in, and all of the other team managers, Mr. Baxter, Mr. Reyes, Ms. Tamblin, Mrs. Cochran Ray, Mrs. Langley, Mrs. Adams, Mrs. Laird, uh, parent Peter Selden. I think I captured all of those. And you heard the one, a couple of teams say that they earned a Da Vinci Award. And the Da Vinci Award and Renaissance Award are two special awards that DI gives out. 
and they're not required to award those at every tournament. So those actually are held in higher regard than the actual medals that are handed out. And so to get one of those awards is definitely a very, very high achievement, and uh, I want you to understand and, and recognize that. So are there more people arrived? Yes. Okay, yeah. come and introduce yourself then. Name and team. Hi, I'm Noah, and I'm from DIY. So say your name and your team. Um, I'm Naomi Doe, and I'm on the Brave Cowards. Okay, thank you. And now we would like all the students to file up here along with your fearless leader, Mr. Hadley, and to have a, a picture with the board. So come on, all you'll have to come all the way across. Yeah, yeah, where's your, I got do, it. do you have any other leaders <laughs> out there? Tell them to come on up. see that. Okay, we've got one up there. Good. Okay, thank you all for coming. You are welcome to stay as long as you'd like. We are gonna carry on with our business of our board meeting. Next up is public input. If you are interested in giving public input tonight, please come to the podium and fill out a form. Did we have any public input? Okay. We are going to add a little item, or big item, depending on how you look at it. We have a new staff member on our administrative team, and so I'm gonna let Donna introduce her. So I would like to introduce to the board Jenny Foster, and um, Vicki's going to come up and um, Tell us a little bit about Jenny. I see she has her family here with us, so we are excited to um, have Jenny joining our team, and thank you to her family in advance, because um, I know this is her first site administrative position, and she's now ours, so <laughs> thank you for sharing her with us. And Vicki, if you would like to give a little sure. background. Like 28. So, First of all, thank you so much for taking the time to recognize one of our new staff members added to Mercer Island. Um, this is Jenny Foster. Jenny comes to us with 28 years of uh, education. Um, most of that has been in the classroom as a Spanish teacher, so she is bilingual, as well as uh, bicultural, because you've been in different countries, living in different countries. And along with that, Jenny also taught at, I hope I get this one right, o Oregon State, right? Yes. Whew. Because if I say the other one, it's like a bad word, you know? <laughs> so um, Jenny uh, taught at Oregon State University as well, and she's currently an instructional coach at um, Snoqualmie Falls School District, and last 10 years have been with Mount Si High School. So um, we're just so glad to have Jenny. One of the things that stuck out in the grueling long process, she had an interview process with um, a 16-member team, 
and she rose to the top very, very quickly because she was able to demonstrate and show her love for kids and um, really, truly kid-driven decision-making, kid-driven in terms of what, what we are all here for. That was the thing that impressed people the most, as well as her most recent teaching and coaching experience um, in the instructional practices in the classroom. But also, um, the other thing that rose to the top was um, her enthusiasm for the job, positive positive um, affect and um, we're just really excited when the students uh, walked around we had students involved in the process um, the students were involved and then Mr. Wold um, who went through this process last year um, <laughs> he reminded me that I didn't give him flowers though so <laughs> I'm going to have to make it up to him yeah. um, so um, they they too said wow we really like this lady we think that she's going to really blend in well with our community and um, again she was their number one um, choice as well so Jenny I want to give you an opportunity to say something and maybe introduce your family um, all right okay. well good evening thank you so much for this opportunity uh, it truly is an honor and I'm incredibly humbled to join the Islander community one thing that I know in 28 years in education is that the value that we place on community and the engagement with parents and families is priceless because it truly is a partnership so I'm excited to become part of this uh, leadership team um, one of the things that I yeah, it was grueling for the interview, but my magical, most favorite moment, I gotta say, were, was the tour with the four students as they took me through the school. And that was my happy place, and just being able to be with kids. So uh, it has been um, an incredible year of learning as an instructional coach, and through this, I had a really holistic uh, and comprehensive admin internship at Mount Sinai High School, so I'm ready for this. I am so excited to be part of the Mercer Island uh, family. So, and speaking of family, I have my husband Robert and our three children, Jackson, Lily, and Henry. And as I said to the leadership team, um, I do, I have a passion for kids and a passion for teachers, and I do, I, you know, that's what drives me uh, every single day is how do we make this better for all? So thank you for this amazing opportunity. Okay. Thank you and welcome. Thank you. And she also baked cookies for the interview team and the kids. <laughs> so she's a great cook. <laughs> okay, and it looks like we don't have any public input. So we'll move on to partial governance process monitoring. Item A, and this is communication support to the board, potential students on governing boards, and go ahead. So what I've um, attached for the board here are um, a WASDA model policy. I know we've spent some time discussing individually um, how we could get student voice more represented. Um, particularly here at, at the board meetings and uh, I know that a couple of, of you attended a session at the WASDA conference where we listened to other boards that have um, integrated students into their board meetings as, as representatives. So the model policy is here um, working closely with the high school because that's where our reps will come from. Um, I've scheduled a time after spring break <laughs> to meet with um, the leadership class there to get their input as to what they think the process um, would best serve them as students in this model. So I hope to be bringing something to the board to adopt as a, a first and then a second reading in a timely manner so we have it ready to go for the new school year and have a process in place to um, have student representatives on the board. Of course, is non-voting um, reps, but certainly allows you to hear th their um, opinions and their input on um, all the things that you make decisions on. Any questions on the on the model policy? The model um, board policy is is fairly generic, um, which is pretty common, and allows us some latitude. So if we think this is how the process is going to work, and then we have to adjust it. Um, you know, the policy will allow for that. It would be more in the procedures as to how to make this work best for everyone, but particularly our students. Well, th thank you for uh, bringing this up and proposing it. I think it's a great idea. Um, 
I think at least three of us had the opportunity at the WASDA conference to see, um, I think it was Riverview mm -hmm. School District and sharing their experience with it. And I'm wondering if, um, if we're ready to just go in kind of cold and listen, I think you've had this model before, mm -hmm. but I'm wondering if it would be beneficial for the board to um, hear from another school district, another board about their experiences um, because I, I think this is something we want to get right uh, <laughs> on the first step. And so I'm just going to throw out there, does it make sense for a group of us to maybe go speak with um, Riverview and kind of find out how it's gone with them or maybe a work study session with them? I think they, they enjoyed the ability to kind of share their thing, not to say that their model is the best, sure. but either that or just um, – I think it would be n nice to hear a background of how this works. Mm -hmm. um, or perhaps you could, it, it would just be enough for you to share how the, the experiences have gone with, with your boards. So, um, of course, Vicki and I have both reached out to contacts, other superintendents, other high school principals that are working in districts where they have um, student representatives on the board. Riverview is one that um, we um, have reached out to. Um, Snoqualmie Falls and it actually Jenny <laughs> has experience in student reps on the board so um, we said great we have a new project for <laughs> you as you come on in so we have reached out to other boards that are doing this um, you know my e experience has been twofold in one model where the students um, had a place on the agenda to give a student report this was a multi high school district though too so we had each high school do a student report for the board be able to answer any questions regarding what was happening at the high school um, but didn't actually sit um, at the meetings and um, frankly students didn't want to stay for the whole meeting. They, you know, they would stay if there was something important. The second model I had, the students did sit at um, the podium and were frequently queried by either the president or one of the other board members to weigh in if we were having a discussion. Um, but we also were very cognizant of their time, and so we all we had an agreed upon time that we would watch the clock and say, you know, the students are dismissed at this time so that if we did run late, it wasn't um, burdensome on, on them as well. So those are a couple of the models. Of course, the students are non-voting members. Um, what I really liked about the Riverview model was their students were there with them and seeing students at the WASDA was really exciting for me, um, having had that same experience in California, my last district, when we went to the California School Board Association, there were student sessions. There was actually a strand that was for student representatives, so it was a wonderful learning experience um, for the students. As superintendent with a student rep, um, it's been a great experience for me in being able to build that relationship with them, um, working them through how how it works and how um, how the governance side of it works. I think it's a wonderful learning opportunity. Um, and the expectations for them, meeting with them to go through, here's the expectations. If you can't be at a meeting, it's expected that you have someone else there. So the responsibilities of it, meeting and going through that with them and just getting to know them during the year um, has been a really valuable um, place for me to be as a superintendent. And knowing that if I had questions, they were someone I could reach out to at the school level and ask for um, their opinion or could they direct me to some other students that I might be able to talk to as well. I know we had a little bit of conversation about do we um, do linkage with students and I think we modeled that a little bit when we visited the high school this year and had the student panel and um, I, I got very positive feedback from that, that that was really valuable to be able to ask um, questions of the students, have them give us that input. So if that was something we wanted to build into the calendar, that could be a part of our model as well, to have that linkage session that includes the students also. But yes, we have reached out to districts that are using the model to get their um, the best practices, what have been the, the stumbling blocks for them so that we can hopefully learn from their experiences. And, but of course we want to make it our own as well. Other comments? 
I'm uh, absolutely enthusiastic about this idea. So I'm all set to go forward. Um, I, I, I think uh, to be able to, uh, to work with the students effectively, it, uh, it might be useful to see how we as a board can talk about this a little bit more. How do we want to, int how do we interact with the students? How do we think about uh, including them in decisions? Um, do we have to do this upfront? Is this something the president and vice president in conjunction with the superintendent uh, figure out which one, which policies the students should weigh in on so they can do their homework beforehand. Uh, I'd like to make this useful for both sides, uh, students as well as uh, the board members too. Uh, I'm just curious, as you think through all this, do you foresee a superintendent's interpretation that goes into these nuances that's perhaps easier and more agile to update and change than board policy, uh, connects up with Vicky's expectations of principal of the high school, the teacher per perhaps, if there's any credit involved. Do you foresee sharing that with the board as well? It would all be outlined in procedures, which we can update um, as we move th through the process, so it's not, the procedures aren't something we necessarily bring to the board, but um, definitely, and that's something Vicki and I are working hand in hand in right now, and why we want to talk to the students as well. Does it become a position on the ASB? Is it an elected position? Do students apply for it? There's lots of different models and ramifications for it. I've seen it where it's part of the student governance, and it's a, it's a position on the student governing board at the school, at the high school, and so the students do vote on those positions so it becomes an elected position. I've seen it be embedded in one of the positions on the student leadership so it's a, a student who um, th knows that if they're elected as the student governance president that this is part of their job and their responsibilities. So all that is something that we are absolutely working through and are going to have all outlined in our procedures and um, how we'll actually work through the, the specifics for the students. Will it be application? Who will do the selection from those applications? How will it be reviewed? Do we want to? Um, th I find that model intriguing. It's not one that I've worked with where you have a junior and a senior. And so it's a two-year commitment for a student. They come in as a junior and then stay for um, the two years and kind of then are the experienced senior rep the second year and help to bring the other person, trade them along and, and so it creates a real leadership role in that model as well. So we're um, working through really with the high school um, admin team as to you know what's going to be the fit um, for Mercer Island High School as we work through that. I'm, I'm really excited because it was something that I think you know many of you, those of you who were, who were part of me coming here, I started talking about it kind of feet on the ground. I was like, where's the student yeah. <laughs> on the board? <laughs> and when I first um, even mentioned at the high school, there was a real concern that, oh, it was one more thing and our students were so busy. And um, that perspective has really changed, that mm. this is a great opportunity for our students, um, a great way for them to learn. Yeah governance and um, process and so I'm really just excited to see that change in um, how, how viable this is and that the kids are actually getting excited about it as well. So like I said, we'll be meeting with the students and then working through um, kind of the logistics of it all with staff um, so that we'll be able to describe what we believe is, is the best way for us to do this and kick this off for next year when we bring it forward to the board as a, as a policy to have a student rep, because right now we don't have a policy. Yeah, I think really, I think that's, that's all great and it really sets my expectations. I think that's super helpful. I think for the board to really uh, have skin in the game and buy into this, uh, I think it's important the board also have visibility and uh, kind of discussion around the policies I, if if the policy on the board side is this generic, mm -hmm. I think that's probably a little too little for the board to really buy 
to, to, to be totally bought into it completely. And I think we'd, we would like the board to be fully involved, understand roles and responsibilities, uh, and to actively take advantage of the kid's presence and do so, uh, it becomes a board requirement as well, uh, a board duty into to some sense. And for us to be able to think about that uh, would be important too. Any other comments or questions? Um, <coughs> I might weigh in. I, I think it's a fantastic idea. I think it speaks to our district's values of inclusiveness and diverse voices. I think to have the student voice here and present at our meetings is uh, paramount for us. Um, and also, it, it speaks to our duty as a school district to instill within our students a sense of civic virtue, um, which is a really important part of our job. Um, and in creating that and addressing the whole child. Um, so I'm very enthusiastic about this process and uh, to get moving on it, yeah. I don't really have a whole lot to say. I do absolutely support student representation on the board um, in whatever way that might be. Um, I think it's important to allow the students to um, make the big choices um, just like you know, we decide whether or not we're going to run and then are elected by our peers. Um, they're not our peers, and that's why I think that their voice is so important. Um, but I think that we, I, I would err on the side of, of not being as involved in the creation and um, expectation uh, decisions. Um, I would lead that to the students. Um, you know, we've got ASB officers and, and senior class officers who. Um, <clears throat> have experience and, and are taking classes and, and lead the school, um, they know their student body the best and um, obviously with the guidance of their um, teachers and administration can, can I think can make those decisions. I don't want, to, I don't want it to be seen as um, we're directing what, what they're going to be doing. Um, I think that we are all um, very student friendly and um, want to hear their voices. So I don't, I don't think that's gonna be an issue now or at all at any point. Okay, great comments. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. I think it sounds like you're in the exploring phase anyway, so I think it would be great to have you continue to do that with staff and students at the, uh, at the high school. And maybe is your would your plan be to bring us some kind of proposal or suggestions of what how you absolutely feels it should look and then get our input at that point. Right, so we'll bring it, we will bring it as a first reading as a suggestion so that we can get input from you as well and make adjustments uh, prior to a second reading. That's why I stated my timeline is we're April already and we wanna make sure we have something in place by the end of June so that we're good to go when school starts um, in September. September. That sounds great, thank you. Okay, uh, let's move on to full governance process monitoring language review for fundamental seven. Uh, does anybody have any ideas uh, for policy language revisions? I had a note from last time um, David, you talking about getting more reporting on bullying and racial incident data that may or may not result in suspensions. I really liked that idea. Do you, have you thought about that some more? Um, I, I thought that feedback was provided uh, at the last meeting. I didn't know if we needed to raise it again here um, or not. Um, I, but yes, I'm still interested in that. I, I believe Jennifer took that away as, a, as an action item, and we did hear public input as well uh, that that would be useful for the board to look at. So I, I, think, I think that'd be great. Thank you for raising that, Tracy. You're welcome. Anyone else have something? Um, building on that, um, I just wanna say, um, as I, I look at the, the fundamental as it's written, I think uh, it, it's a great statement. Um, I know that our superintendent is working on a previous interpretation uh, that, that you inherited. Uh, and so now that you've had a year, or closing in on a year of uh, working at, at the head of the district, um, I look forward to seeing 
um, some of your interpretations begin to take over in this and to hear your voice uh, in this. Um, I think that both the interpretation is, is really robust. I think it hits on um, the important points of equity and diversity um, and how we go about that, um, how we about go about fostering a community uh, that supports diversity and inclusion and equity. Um, I see a lot of proactive things in the interpretation uh, that support that. The only piece that I'm kind of missing, and it, this builds off of um, David's comment, is uh, that monitoring and tracking. And so that's a, a fine line um, that, that starts to get into the weeds in administrative work, uh, which I don't want to go to. So I wanted to um, echo David's uh, recommendation or request that we maybe see a little more data, qualitative and quantitative, um, tracking those HIB incidents, uh, the frequency of which, and if possible, um, while protecting the uh, privacy of our students, um, if we could also get a lens on uh, specifically discriminatory actions. So whether um, these incidents of harassment, intimidation, or bullying um, are also exacerbated by um, either racial cues or um, anything along the lines of gender expression or, uh, or anything along that, ability, background, religion. Um, there are a lot of things that are very visible um, that are obvious and there are also invisible things. But for a student who's already dealing um, with pressures or a sense of exclusion or not being a part of the community, if an incident of bullying or whatever adds on to that with discriminatory language or whatever, I, I would like to see, if we can, that broken out as well so that we can kind of track how this process of second step and how the district is creating this new language and interpersonal vocabulary between students and staff and parents that we can maybe use this to track the effectiveness of that as it continues to grow. I wanted to bring up another suggestion that I didn't want to. I wanted to, to allow time for the superintendent to respond at all. If the certainly, there will. Yeah, <laughs> certainly, there will. Um, I appreciate you know Brian's comments regarding you know being uh, not embraced as as a fundamental seven. Um, the monitoring and tracking of of discipline um, certainly is is viable. We do record um, a lot of actions, but not all, because there's many, many things that just happen in that quick, teachable moment, particularly with our youngest students. And so that um, being a data point could be quite problematic to, to try and track. But we certainly do have some tracking of other than suspensions, and suspension, of course, is the big data that's tracked um, statewide, nationwide. You know, that's that's a great concern. Um, but there are certainly other kinds of data tracking for when a student goes to a higher level than just a teacher or one staff member having a conversation and remediating is when the child does it again so they didn't learn that um, we start to then create tracking mechanisms that we can potentially um, bring forward. Of course, with any new data, um, how how far back we can go could be problematic. It might be that that will be your, your baseline, right? That's going to be your first year. But we'll, we're working with staff on how can we pull that out and maintain confidentiality, but not add new tracking of things that are um, part of working with particularly young children every day. So when it makes it to the next level, which is generally going to be um, the site administration level, then we start to have those document documentation pieces. Um, so I think I talked to you in a, a different setting about um, Bellevue School District having a button on their front page of their website that has a report bullying button that can be a way of, of um, reporting incidents. Um, and I wonder if something like that might be a good way to, to track some of that data as well. Or And I, 
I would understand that anything like this that we're talking about that would be relatively new, we would have just a first year of data, nothing to compare it to. But then over time, it might be helpful. Um, my concern is is that sometimes we hear about things in the community, or sometimes it's a person who comes to public input reporting on what other people say. And I think a lot of people just don't know how to report some of the incidents that um, that are happening with their children, and they hear about it from their child, maybe even a few days later. Um, or the child holds it in for a long time before it comes out in some other way. Um, and I, I just want to make sure that we're, that not only our school, the school building and everybody that can help those children are aware of it, um, but that we are seeing something about how, how the numbers look so that we can talk about how we can bring those numbers down if they're, if they are concerning or if they're typical for, you know, kids are going to say things that offend each other um, and how are those handled. Um, but if there's a growing non-welcome kind of culture building in schools, we want to be aware of that. Um, and if there's any way that we can, uh, you know, when we hear about the school reports uh, at the last meeting, there's so much wonderful thing, so many wonderful things going on, and yet we know some kids are still feeling um, some instances of unwelcome behaviors too. So um, I think that's just if we can find a way to measure some of the more um, some of the smaller things that aren't just a suspension, because I think we're doing a great job in reducing the number of suspensions, which is great. But then when we do that, it doesn't mean that everything's rosy. So, so social-emotional learning is absolutely ongoing work. It never, ever ends um, because we have new kids all the time. That's what's so exciting about it. Um, I am familiar with the button <laughs> on the website that you were talking about. We've actually been investigating that a little bit. It's part of um, a product we get through our risk pool. And so we wanted to make sure that it provided um, more than just bullying. So it was actually kind of a safety reporting piece so people could feel safe in reporting things um, anonymously. That's what the intent of that button is. And they is. also have a, rep they have two separate yeah. buttons. Yeah, report a concern and report bullying. Yeah. So we're, we're looking at that and working with the company that pr provides that to see um, the first take on it um, when it was brought from the company was there was it wasn't the best solution, but we're hoping it's been updated and we can implement that, um, particularly at the high school, because it allows students to report and you can report it out to them and it becomes um, like a mobile app on their phone, so it makes it fairly easy for them to report and then provides us a, a tracking of um, those incidents. And again, you have to make sure you're not um, counting the same incident and so it's building a false um, peak or concern that um, maybe it was one time but five people report it but it was really only one incident so we do have to be careful in our data that we're making sure it's it's real data and not um, over reporting of things so we are investigating that and hoping to have something that we can bring that allows for that safety concerns that people can report on and definitely looking at how can we measure other than suspensions we do have some systems how do we best extract that data thank you yeah. and then um, so this is a different topic just talking about data and the, the metrics uh, the qualitative metrics and just want to mention that that button is, it leads to metrics, but it's also operational. And I, I, I do want to respect that those type of buttons need to be investigated, and that's more of the superintendent's work, because when you create a reporting thing, it has all sorts of ramifications down the road, legal, et cetera. Um, <clears throat> I tried this last year. I'm going to try it again. <laughs> Um, and this, we had a um, presentation by I think Greg Lobdell, who was Center for Educational Effectiveness, Better Data, Better Decisions, Better Schools, and he provides us, or that, the center provides us the um, CE. Let's see, Educational Effectiveness Annual Survey, the EES survey data, mm -hmm. and so I'm looking at these indicators that are. 
reported as part of um, Fundamental 7. And I mentioned this last year and it didn't resonate and I'm, it's, that's on me. I don't think I was very clear in it and I'm gonna try it again and try to speak differently about it. Um, specifically, the question, pers um, percentage of parents who agree this school has activities that celebrate different cultures including mine. And that could be parents, students, et cetera. Uh, right now, we just report an average. And when you have a majority population, they could say, hey, I'm reporting a four or five. It's working really well for me. And if you have a minority population, that might be 5% or 10%. Uh, if you have dissimilar results there, you, at an extreme, you might get a bimodal distribution of the data. And if we're just reporting an average, that disparity of that response is gonna be lost. So I, I, at the time I said, well, why don't we report the variance? Because if, if, if the variance or the, the differential in the distribution was larger for certain questions, then it might lead to better understanding that, that data. Because if you have a majority population that's 90%, and <laughs> I, would, I, would, I would assume that they're gonna, because it's a majority population and because of institutional biases, et cetera, that they're gonna say this, this uh, institution speaks to my uh, cultures. And it's gonna wash out the very data we're trying to get, which is inclusiveness and diversity. Um, so, um, and I don't, I don't, I don't know if uh, just repair, reporting the variance would actually achieve that. Um, but what would be interesting to see is to see a bar graph of that question answered by the different cultures or ethnicities, um, and then you could really see how we're doing. Um, now, it also depends upon the sample size. And if the N wasn't greater than 20, perhaps that is a challenge. But actually, since there's not any, not any uh, identification, I think, with these surveys, maybe that's not a concern, as opposed to student test scores. So um, I'm just gonna throw that out as a suggestion, and maybe hopefully, um, if other board members wanted to talk about that now, great, but, um, if, if you or your staff could think about it and or maybe even consider talking to um, EES. EES and see why that's a bad idea. <laughs> I think that's, um, you, you did a better job this year. Okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> it wasn't all math. <laughs> I know, I think that's an excellent point you raise and uh, perhaps if our ends were too small in some of our ethnicities it could be group together like other races um uh i think it's definitely seems worth uh pursuing in my opinion i i would agree um if it's possible um and is able to give us some quantitative data that uh, we can rely on for that. Um, I think it's important because we do have a shifting culture in our school district. Uh, we're growing in diversity, um, and especially at my home school, West Mercer, we're seeing a, a huge shift uh, this year. And so um, ensuring that we don't have a dominant culture that's um, swaying our test results or survey results um, and being able to provide input for us at a policy level to make sure that we're monitoring our policies in a way that create um, that equity for every student in our district, I think is incredibly important. So thank you for suggesting that. I also think it's a great suggestion. Um, as we get to, um, you know, breaking down diversity and looking at all of the different characteristics, um, you know, I, th I, I think it's an overall um, understanding that um, one's religion doesn't isn't going to have a tremendous impact on their test scores, but it certainly is going to have a tremendous impact on inclusiveness. 
And um, I'm a little bit afraid that that opens up a can of worms because one might look like a majority but have a minority religion um, that isn't as obvious and, and minority religions get left out um, all the time and continue to do so. Um, I, so I'm absolutely open to it. I think it's really important. Um, I just am concerned about some of the negatives that could come along with that as well. Just for my clarity, did I, um, did I, did I bring up religion or, uh, okay. No, are, are, I, are, I am because okay. when we're talking about race, I mean, I'll, I'll just use my personal example. Um, when we're talking about race, um, you know, I fall in the majority. When we're talking about gender, um, well, that's kind of, it's almost a 50-50, but it certainly isn't in terms of rights and opportunities. Um, when we're talking about religion, i Jewish, um, the majority, I mean, Wal Wal Mercer Island, I think, is a community of tremendous inclusiveness and understanding. Um, there still are um, many religious um, observances um, missing, you know, uh, missing, missing, while, while there aren't supposed to be activities on holidays um, that are different than the majorities, there are. Um, it continues to happen. It's a battle every year. There's sporting events on major holidays um, when there would never be for the ma majority religion. Um, so no, I, I know that you weren't speaking of it, but like I said, when we're talking about um, a group's uh, feeling of inclusiveness, uh, I think religious inclusiveness matters as much. Um, and like I said, it, it's different when you're looking at just test scores, which it's, it's easier to break down. Um, but, but, you know, inclusion is inclusion. And um, when, when, you know, music choices at, at concerts are, are religious in nature, um, you know, the majority doesn't understand um, that singing about someone else's religion might be just uncomfortable. Um, and it happens, I know it happens, I know it still continues to happen and, and I would like to say it, it always will, or I don't wanna say it always will, I think it will. I'm just, I'm just, I'm only using that one as an example um, that as we look to inclusiveness, um, I think the general message needs to be um, every individuals and, um, and, and understanding and respecting everyone's individuality where they come from, what they believe in, um, but but the more that you focus on just one aspect of diversity, you're going to have issues with the other aspects of diversity. Did you want to respond to any of those? <laughs> I think the bar graph will probably be um, easier to replicate than trying to report on a variance. But if staff has further questions about the specific question that you're ad addressing, they might be contacting you so we can clearly dive into um, exactly which, which question you're referring to that you saw on the EES survey and is there more than one, right? Because do we just wanna pull that one out or some others that are, are maybe in the same vein that we might wanna look at as well? It's a suggestion, and if it makes sense, um, great. And if there's a, uh, there's a legal reason or a um, logistical reason it can't be done, I totally appreciate that, but uh, appreciate um, you and your staff considering it. And it's absolutely something we meet with EES annually as well, so it's a, a question that we can pose with them also. And thank you for bringing that up, Deborah, about the religious holidays. And I think that that's a really good point that I know that sometimes was talked about in our schools, but not often enough to avoid those conflicts. Okay, so are we done with fundamental seven? Okay. So moving on to you need to take oh, we need to take action. So wait a second. 
But we're doing the, it's just the language review, right? Right, but if there's any um, revisions supported by a majority of the, vo the board, this so we is need an a action item. Do we need a motion? So I think there were two enough. things on the table. Mm -hmm. One was the HIV data, and the second one was the suggestion around um, <coughs> expanding out some of the data so we can find out the uh, dissatisfied, let's put it that way, uh, students uh, and see if there's any commonality around them that we are missing in that data. It's too easy to say we're 90% satisfied uh, without looking at is there a group that's incredibly dissatisfied with the current situation. So I think those are the two motions maybe we could have here. Is that correct? Am I seeing a nod of agreement? So I'll, maybe I'll start with the first one. Uh, I move that we, uh, that I move that we add uh, more detail around HIV in, with respect to diversity and discrimination data uh, be presented to the board uh, in future uh, Fundamental 7 reports. Second? I'll second that. Thank you. Any further discussion? Okay, all those in favor well, say aye. I, oh, I just wanna, I, I'm, I'm not opposed. Um, I just, I'm a little con concerned we're um, making a motion on that too soon without an understanding of what that actually means, unless I'm confused. I mean, if we're talking about um, This we, it seems very vague at this point. So let me quickly clarify. Uh, I think the idea is for the board to come to a majority uh, or not uh, decision around the desire for this data. I think then it's up to the superintendent to decide what data is, as discussed during our previous discussion, what data she actually brings forward and then we can have a discussion as to whether that data meets our needs or not. I think there was some, there were, the superintendent raised logistical issues, uh, potential legal issues, potential you know, new procedures that have to be implemented and developed. Uh, I think uh, we, during our discussion, we scoped it really to data that we already have as opposed to introducing new data. And then the superintendent's discretion and, and experience and expertise to decide what she actually brings forward. But the motion would be about the board saying, one, we think it's interesting, two, uh, a majority of the board thinks it's interesting, and uh, three, it's at the superintendent's discretion to then go figure out what's right Thank without you. being incredibly specific. Okay, okay. All those in favor? Aye. 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 No opposed? Okay, great. Do you want to take a stab at the second uh, motion? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, make a motion that uh, the board is interest is potentially interested in seeing if it's possible to disaggregate the EES data uh, with respect to ethnicity and race in order to uh, can I remove the majority bias from the data to see if it's possible. I second. Any further discussion? Okay, all those in favor say aye. 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 No opposed? Great, we will move on now to the consent agenda. Looking for a motion. I move we approve the consent agenda as published. I'll second that. All those in favor? Aye. 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 No opposed? Okay, and we now have the superintendent's report. So a few things for you tonight. Um, first, 
up is um, a document called Board and Administrator for School Board Members. It's an informational um, article that will come once a month. It has um, kind of current things that are happening for school boards, not just locally, but nationwide. Um, what are hot topics, so to speak? It's just a simple um, single document. The superintendent one that comes with it is much more extensive, <laughs> but this just gives you um, kind of some light reading as to school board responsibility. So we'll bring these to you um, monthly. And so at the first meeting of the month, we should have them for you. Next up is a reminder, which I'm sure you all don't need, about the um, foundation breakfast on April 24th. And I also, would like to let the board know that as per last year's breakfast, um, it has been arranged that the Pathfinder Award winners, Don Bennett, Mary Lindquist, Marty Lott, and hopefully Joel McHale, will um, meet with the board um, for an informal lunch gathering at 1115 in the Commons Conference Room in the high school. So. Um, Craig and Penny are getting that all arranged, but he, Craig would like to know if you will be able to join us so that he can make appropriate arrangements for that. So if you could either let Kendall know via email and, and CC Craig on that as well, we can make sure that we have that arranged. And Craig did send out an email this afternoon. Yes. Um, just a quick, another information piece. Um, we are coming into spring break. I'm sure you were all well aware of that. But after spring break, we do have some major things happening. One, of course, being the breakfast. Another one being another Parent Edge um, event on April 23rd. This is a repeat event because it's um, been something that has been um, really important in our community. This is the um, partnership between Parent Edge and the MI Forefront team. And it will be at the Islander Middle School. And it is um, the suicide prevention for parents. And I know that that's been something that's been here before. So that's available for the board to be aware of as well. State assessment window opened and our elementary students have completed the language arts um, component of that. The window now will be opened all the way through May until our high schoolers are finished. So um, it was, uh, Andre's department was very pleased to announce to me that we had no technical glitches as this opened up because normally you do. We had one today when we were trying to figure out why the superintendent couldn't submit the form, but we overcame that too. So it's, it's up and running and, and going. During spring break, it was reported to you in Brandy's last report that we would be um, looking to do some work on the pool, and that is scheduled. The work is planned to start on um, the 7th and 8th when they'll drain the pool, and then on the 9th through the 13th, the company New Flow that will be doing that very inventive system on the pipes will be working on the pipes. And then the goal is that on April 14th, the pool will be refilled and heated. So it will be closed during that time as they do that work. So just wanted to give you an update on that as well. And lastly, we are working on um, the linkage session with the city, there had there's some conversation in moving that, and so we, we did reschedule it, but I don't have the set date. I'm anticipating it will be in June, and potential topics for that will, of course, include the pool. Um, their transportation plan, we have, um, I don't want to report completely on it yet. Yeah, you might have read about it in the Mercer Island Reporter about the sharing of the Uber and the Lyft rides. And we think that that has some potential for our employees. So we'll have more to report on that as that comes to fruition. Of course, fields and of course, uh, safety emergency planning will all be um, potential topics and any others that are suggested as we plan through that meeting. I'm sure uh, mental health counselors will be a topic that will be on that linkage meeting as well. And that's all I have for tonight.
Thank you, Donna. On board reports. David? I'll just say uh, good luck to the Destination Imagination teams uh, over spring break. Uh, Globals is wonderful. Uh, I know how difficult it is. I've gotten to be a judge, uh, an adjudicator, I think that's what they call us, uh, and got to wear my fancy cap that uh, all adjudicators wear. You have to make a, you have to make a cap uh, that is electronic or has something fancy uh, or designed well or something like that. And uh, so that was a lot of fun. So uh, good luck to the teams. Uh, well, because of the shortened break, I haven't had a chance to get into too much trouble. Um, so um, I've tried to keep busy. Uh, I want to thank um, uh, Fred. Uh, for the work on the YFS panel that happened just this week. Um, Youth and Family Services provided a panel on uh, strong parenting, and uh, As Associate Superintendent Rendell uh, sat in on that panel and provided uh, feedback, and it was done during a, a Facebook Live event. So I watched through Facebook Live. <laughs> I didn't see you in the audience, so I yeah. thought maybe I missed a board member. No. That wouldn't have been so good in the eyes of my superintendent here. So I'm glad you were on Facebook Live and not there. Yes, I was utilizing technology, and the only comment was, could you please move the camera counterclockwise? Because <laughs> we were watching like this for the first 10 minutes. Um, but no, I thought it was a great discussion. I thought you had a lot of great input, so thank you for doing that. And thank you to Youth and Family Services and the, the students who also participated and provided that input. Um, also, uh, in between our two meetings, uh, the superintendent and I attended the uh, WASDA Policy Governance and Coherent Governance Summit, which was a first-time event. Um, there are around 40 uh, districts within the, the state of the 300 unique districts that run either a policy governance or a coherent governance model or some hybrid therein. Um, and so this was the first time WASDA gathered as many of us that could make it together in the room uh, in round tables. Um, as opposed to a lecture or PowerPoint to discuss what's working, what's not working, ask questions and clarification, and to see what extra supports that they can provide for us as boards who are doing this, including central sources where we can connect with each other, identify which districts, see model policies, and clarify some language and things. So it was fantastic to be a part of that event, um, so I want to say thank you to WASDA and the facilitators and the board at the uh, WASDA level for facilitating that. And I think that we'll be seeing more of those summits showing up as we move forward. So be watching for those. And um, a congratulations to our kiddos who just completed the first phase of the SBAC tests. And uh, good job, kids. You're awesome. Deborah? Um, I'm going to pass my time today. We'll wait till I'm a little more clear headed. Thanks. Well, um, I'm just going to share uh, something I've already shared with uh, uh, Brian. I, I was watching the Issaquah board, school board meeting, and they had a legislator come and provide public input, and they mentioned that they were sponsoring a bill that would provide, I think, a minimum of 10% state matching funds for school construction. So I think that's something maybe we can kind of keep an eye on and, and help support. Uh, given that I think we got 2% maybe or if that so Thanks. Uh, I attended the West Mercer PAC uh, meeting is that a week two weeks ago almost uh, and it yeah it was right after our last meeting because we had uh, heard about fundamental seven and um, Carol best presented to the group a little bit about uh, the fundamental seven data and um, some of the ELL data as well, which was really interesting to see. Uh, some of the concerns in that group were about walking routes on West Mercer Way um, near the school and um, some of the lower numbers that they've had over the last two years, I guess, in the high cap. Uh, and one parent was concerned about the lack of homework in second grade because they're doing an experiment where they have kids do more of a choice thing and some, you know, reading time or go outside and look at rocks or something. And so it's uh, less structured homework and that's making a few parents uncomfortable, I guess. So that was an interesting discussion. Uh, I also attended Showcase one evening to see my daughter's last choir performance at Showcase, which we've been going to for many years now. 
Um, and that was a great event as always. And it was great to see Superintendent Kolaski or hear her. I couldn't quite see her through the all the stuff on the gym floor as I was sitting low down. But uh, it, she did a wonderful job uh, kind of emceeing at least that portion. I'm not sure if you did the whole event, but that was really great uh, to see you in action there and to see her thrilled about our showcase. So that was awesome. Uh, and we had our, strategic, our special meeting last week on strategic planning and just wanted to report out that uh, we started some discussions about considering revisiting our 2020 vision um, as we are in 2018. We're getting very close to 2020. Um, it also happens to be the policy number for our vision. Um, that it's 2020. So uh, we are embarking on a process. We're not sure where it's going or how much change will come um, or how the process will actually play out. Um, but as our, uh, our fundamentals are continually updated each year, as we just were looking at fundamental seven, um, it's possible that we'll keep the work of the fundamentals or change some things. We could reevaluate our mission and our goals for the district. Um, or at a minimum, just update the name uh, since we're approaching 2020 and, and maybe call it 2030 or something like that. Um, but we do want to continually look forward as it is our vision and we don't want to be looking back at 2020 in the rear view mirror. So uh, I just wanted to let everybody know about that and we will keep you posted on how it uh, progresses. Uh, I think that's all I have. Well, we have uh, coming up next, we have our, uh, we have an executive session pursuant to RCW 4230-110-1G, uh, and it will be to conduct a, an executive session to review performance of public employee pursuant to RCWs, um, the, the RCW that I just mentioned. No final action will be taken. Uh, we will reconvene at the regular meeting after about I'll estimate 45 minutes, could be less or more, and uh, then we'll reconvene here and adjourn the meeting. Okay. So, I guess we don't have to do a vote for taking a recess to the exec session? No? Okay. Great. So that's all. Thank you.